I, I appreciate the opportunity to uh, introduce some of the recent work that we've been doing in modeling earthquake and SOSIP sequence and a bit of dynamic rupture simulation with the incorporation of three-dimensional fault geometry. Um, this presentation is going to be many folks on uh, work from uh, several students and postdocs. Um, Lei and Lei is currently at China Earthquake Administration, and Duo from uh, Air Amnion Munich. Um, Hong Yu is now at Geological Survey in Canada, and Wen Chang is currently in my group. Um, so I think we've heard um, from a couple of previous talks and what Pierre just talked about the influence, a strong influence of fault geometry um, on the total amount of slip and also the rupture processes for earthquakes. Um, there's a long list of literature. I'm just showing a few examples of uh, recent dynamic rupture models with multiple fault segments, like from the 2018 Kaikoura earthquake with notoriously uh, March fault ruptures. And, uh, and close to home is the Mitruvara fault that at the southern end of the Vancouver Islands that based on seismicity extends offshore with a step over toward the Washington state. So a uh, former student, Gu Li and I, we modeled the step over system and tried to look at how the um, overstressed um, zone on the step over fault is developing because of the incoming rupture from the main fault and how that influences the, um, the, the jump across the step over. Um, and there's another group of models that target earthquake cycles with uh, non-planar faults. Um, again, this is just a few examples from a long list of previous studies. So for example, there's a uh, fault band fold um, in both say strike slip settings from Duan and uh, Augusti earlier studies from 20 to 25. And more recently, uh, Sathya Kuma um, look at it in the thrust folding segment. Um, I think those studies um, have similar findings that the, the kink locations is, uh, is likely to become a rupture nucleation and termination point. Um, and there is also, for example, the, uh, from the Dao Zilu recent study looking at how the flat ramp, flat geometry of the main Himalaya thrust might affect the bimodal seismicity, um, which is basically how some of the earthquakes would be limited to downzip rupture, become blind ruptures, but others would be able to uh, slip all the way to the surface. Um, on top of that, we have uh, tried to look at um, also the large scale max thrust fault geometry might have on the episodic source event. Um, again, with the focus on the Cascadia subduction zone. So um, what I want to focus today is um, this um, Yinxiu Beichuan fault um, that has hosted the 2008 Wenchuan earthquake, um, not just because that this is a, a very complicated fault system uh, with, with very heterogeneous co-seismic uh, as, as we can see from the figure to the right, that from the surface ruptures compiled from a, a number of studies, um, but also uh, a series of trenching studies that have been conducted along the fault from south east, southwest end to the northeastern side, uh, which has resulted in a, a very interesting data set, paleo seismic data set that shows um, there's likely uh, a segmentation uh, around the Beichuan uh, town that makes this um, initial Beichuan fault into the southern versus northern segment, where the 2008 Wenchuan earthquake ruptured the entire segment, but maybe um, historic earthquakes have stopped at this um, junction point with um, the individual rupture, uh, for example, the earthquake from 942 that only ruptured the northern segment um, 
including the guixi to pinxi um, part. So um, our, we, we started from a fault geometry with five segments of fault uh, from the uh, geodetic inversion study uh, from previous um, literature works. And we stitched together the five segments um, and used this blind um, smoothing and extrapolation function to make the fault geometry into a continuous um, uh, um, kind of continuous fault, uh, where on the top and the bottom shows individually how the dip angle is changing, as well as the fault strike angle with respect to the north direction for the entire fault. Um, I just want to point out here probably the most prominent kind of feature from this stitched together fault segment feature is this large change in the fault dipping angle near the town of Memba. And we're going to see in our simulation results that how this plays an important role in the rupture segmentation. Um, so a bit about the model setup, we applied the wind state friction with the aging evolution law um, to the fault um, surface. The, uh, it, it comes with the radiation damping term and also is um, uses the quasi-dynamic approximation. So we have heard from a, a couple of previous talks and in Pierre's presentation as well about the comparison between the uh, fully dynamic versus quasi-dynamic um, simulation results. So I'll try to maybe come back to that and um, in terms of the implications for the for the um, the rupture segmentation that we're we're trying to simulate here. Uh, the other feature of the model is that we consider normal stress change due to slip. So this is uh, in the same fashion as the how shear stress change versus the slip um, distribution on the fault. So that's basically another um, convolution of the matrix into the, into the code. Um, we use the rain state friction stability parameter A minus B um, from the, the standard um, classical blanket et al. wet Greenwich, Greenwich gouge um, experimental data um, based on the uh, study that the Norman Shan fault is primarily composed of um, Precambrian granitic rocks. Um, and um, so we, we basically mapped the temperature dependent uh, lab friction data onto a depth dependent profile um, by using a Norman Shan geothermal model. So, um, Oh, the, the pore pressure distribution, again, like follows the assumption from RICE 992 that except for the, for the, um, the shallowest couple of kilometers, um, pore pressure is going to follow the static gradient uh, at depth results in a constant effective normal stress. Um, again, this is um, based or, or is supported by observation of fluid inclusion measurements of exhumed granitic Lomenshan uh, fault zone rocks, which suggests that um, there is uh, likely sub lithostatic pore pressure at the hydrocentral depths of the 2008 rupture area. Um, I just want to kind of point out here that what we are applying in terms of model parameters onto the fault zone are very uniform, um, except for the depth variation. So there is no other uh, along strike variation in those uh, rain state friction parameters or um, effective normal stress parameters, with the, the, the only exception is the uh, tectonic loading rate or fault loading rate that's uh, being assumed to be varying along the strike with a maximum rate about 2.2 millimeters per year from the southwest, um, uh, gradually decreasing to zero um, toward the northern end of the fault. And this is to, to, to approximate the, the variation of the rate because of the eastward extrusion of the Tibet Plateau toward the Sichuan Basin. Um, 
And we also assume that the slip vector on the fault is a vector sum of the strike versus slip direction. So we're modeling the oblique uh, reverse faulting problem. Um, so here are just some first order uh, observables or measurables from the simulation. Um, so you can see that this is a time record uh, for about 68,000 years of simulation um, time. Uh, again, because of the loading rate is really, really low, just a couple of millimeters per year. Therefore, where you were, were, were seeing those um, earthquake cycles for a long time record. And also because of the north to south or south to north variation in the, in the um, uh, play loading rate. And that's why we're seeing the large imbalance in terms of cumulative fault slip from the south to the north region. Um, the other uh, kind of first order feature that you might observe from this map is that the ruptures are, are segmented or are, di are divided into three types of uh, events where um, a large event would rupture the entire fault. Um, and then there will be uh, two kind of sub events or smaller ruptures with the segmentation around the town of of Namba. Um, the recurrence intervals of those large uh, magnitude eight earthquakes uh, is on the order of three to 4,000 years. And this is also consistent from uh, with the paleoseismic record um, from the trenching studies. Now, um, I wanna come back to the structure segmentation near Namba. And if you remember from the uh, geometry that I had at the very beginning, that this is where we have the largest change in the fault dipping angle. Um, so, so we're, we're basically concluding that this is the the first order control in terms of a long strike rupture segmentation, the strongest uh, a long strike gradient in the fault angle, which I think might be equivalent or similar to uh, what Pierre refers to as a curvature of the fault geometry. Um, and this, the, the similar observation from simulation um, uh, was, was uh, achieved at an earlier modeling study, uh, looking at, again, earthquake rupture sequences on a Manina subsection fault uh, that's between the South China Sea and the Philippine Plate. So here we're seeing that the large uh, or strong fault dipping angle change from about the middle of the model uh, domain, which is right here. That also uh, is the, the second segmentation point where it prevents one of those smaller events or one of those smaller types of events from further propagating toward the north direction. Um, I want to come back a little bit, uh, talk about the general feature of the uh, rupture speed as a function of uh, a long strike distance. Um, so from the correlation that we have from the top, mat, uh, top plot here to this middle plot here, that we can see there's a, there's a, a very obvious first order correlation in terms of that rupture speed accelerates or becomes faster as we go to a uh, steeper dipping fault and kind of drops down as we come to shallower dipping faults. So this is the along strike uh, gradient in the fault dipping angle is um, playing the, the effect. Um, and there, there's also, or there are also smaller feature or shorter wavelength variations in the rupture speed and the slip rate uh, along the profile. Um, I guess I had a different arrangement uh, when I prepared the slide. So, okay, so this uh, this figure here is showing the correlation or maybe lack of correlation between the the weight of uh, seismogenic zones. That's where the friction parameter A minus B is is negative or velocity weakening zone. Um, so, in general, uh, if we keep all the other parameters being constant you would expect to have a higher co-size mix clip uh, when the seismogenic zone or velocity weakening zone is 
is wider, but we see the exception in this, like these two segments along the along the profile that corresponds to the segments where the slip rates accelerate because of the geometry um, change. Um, so I think we're we're attributing that this variation in co-seismic slip um, is not only controlled by the weight of the seismogenic zone, but the 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 geometry also comes into effect. So this is what I wanted to uh, point out of this shorter wavelength variations um, in the in the modeled or simulated rupture seed variation corresponds more to the variation in the fault strike angle or the, the gradient of the fault strike angle. Um, and that's also reflected in the uh, initial stress or pre-stress values before the rupture uh, comes to the individual segments on the fault. Um, again, I think this might correspond to what uh, Pierre showed in those um, rough fault examples where there's a large variation and high frequency variation in the topography of the fault. Um, we could also attempt to make some comparisons between our modeled co-seismic SIP to what geodetic inversion of the co-seismic SIP, um, but I, I wouldn't go too far with that, except by pointing out that um, there is there is a stronger or larger amount of SIP toward the southern segment than uh, to the northern segment. Um, because a lot of features, uh, like for example, we're missing this large surface rupture that has been uh, uh, observed uh, from, from geological surveys, but also from the geodetic inversion studies. So I think that there, there is um, missing mechanisms in this model that should have been uh, included or should be added in order to expand this kind of local uh, high amplitude uh, sleep features. Um, we we'll also try to compare uh, the model predicted uh, surface displacement, so as synthetic GPS vectors, with the uh, with the observed co-size mix-up. So on the left side is um, if we assume that the sleep vector is a constant direction. I think in this case here we have a strike versus steep ratio of about two. Um, so in this case, you see there's a large discrepancy uh, between the synthetic and the observed GPS vectors for stations that's very, very close to, to the fault, uh, which basically is telling us that we're not, this um, strike dip ratio of two is not fully, is not capturing the orientation of the slip. Uh, to the northern, to the southern part of the fault, because we knew from um, seismic inversion studies that the um, the earthquake started as more or less a frost fault uh, rupture and then gradually transitioned to a strike slip uh, rupture. So the modification that we did here is to allow the um, the tectonic loading. Um, vector to have a variable direction along the strike. Uh, this, to some extent, um, have corrected some of the discrepancies of the near fault stations, but not all of them. For example, this one that's near uh, Beichuan um, is, is still not um, showing a good agreement. And I think maybe this, this is tied back to uh, the additional mechanism that we're missing in, in our model in order to account uh, for this local um, intensity of SIP. Um, I just want to kind of further point out that things that I already pointed out that we're using this quasi-dynamic approximation for, for the um, earthquake sequence model. And we also have a more or less uniform uh, distribution of the model parameters uh, along the fault with uh, depth variable distribution. Um, we also neglected uh, some, a couple of the secondary faults that um, as shown by the geodetic inversion, uh, was also evolved in the co seismic rupture. Uh, so, this is the um, Jiangyou Guanxian fault, and there is a, a minor fault called uh, Xia Yudong fault that's possibly connecting the Beichuan, uh, Inshou Beichuan fault to the uh, Guanxian fault. 
So this leads me to the kind of the next section that we're trying to incorporate this more complicated March fault segment, uh, March fault segment uh, into the simulation um, by by developing a new numerical scheme that's based on the. Um, I'll try to move this out of the way. That's based on the discontinuous um, Gallican method, um, which is uh, more more um, advantageous for uh, simulating complicated fault geometry. Um, so um, here we have the uh, much fault segment geometry from Hubbard et al. And we also included the topography variation because there's a strong contrast on both sides of the fault. Um, as you can see clearly from this map, uh, we also included, so in addition to the two parallel faults, we also included this Jarudon fault that uh, in the model we assumed to be connecting the two parallel faults. Uh, but I don't think there is a clear geo geological evidence about the connection at depth yet. So that's the assumption that we're, we're making in the model. Um, the paper that we just submitted is actually more about the method um, and how it's been developed to, to uh, address for a modification that we made in the way to simulate the numerical flux in the DT method. Uh, to reduce the dependence on the mesh quality. So um, this is actually a comparison of, we just took one of the uh, benchmark problems of a shallow dipping across the fault. Um, so you, you can see that with just applying the upwind fluxes, uh, we have uh, very strong spatial oscillations and particularly in the shear stress case, um, the modifications we, we made is to, uh, instead of using a uniform upwind fluxes, uh, upwind flux, uh, we would uh, use a, a mixed flux with a combination of upwind and central fluxes that would, uh, especially for, for the elements with uh, asymmetric shapes uh, adjacent, directly adjacent to the fault surface. So um, the mixed flux scenarios would greatly um, improve the, the spatial oscillation problem uh, with, with a similar um, numerical resolution. So we, um, toward the end of the paper, we decided to apply that also to a, a, a realistic or natural fault structure. That's where Wen Chang came to the, uh, to the picture. Um, so this is just again showing that how the geometric fault geometric has affected the rupture propagation on the fault. Um, all the other parameters like uh, the initial residual stresses um, that that have been assumed to be constant with uh, along the fault. Um, so I just want to come quickly back to this comparison between dynamic and uh, quasi-dynamic simulations of the co-seismic. So this, the top is what we had from the quasi-dynamic simulation um, of one of this uh, largest rupture across the fault. So we can see there is variation of the rupture speed as we move from south to the northern uh, um, end of the fault. And um, those are two versions of dynamic rupture simulations of the uh, 2008 Wenchuan earthquake. So you can probably, it's hard to, uh, to, to, to kind of tell by eye directly from those images, but you can probably see there is acceleration as the rupture has crossed the uh, um, Guangchuan uh, Tom. So this segment between Guangchuan and the Beichuan seems to have a larger rupture speed um, compared to the southern part. And um, there seems to be, again, a, a reduction in the rupture speed as the rupture has passed or come close to the uh, Nanba town. Um, and this is from mm -hmm. our recent uh, simulation of the um, Wenchuan earthquake rupture. Um, so I think 
it, it seems from the comparison here that the the large scale broader features of those variation in rupture speed uh, is kept in a comparison between quasi dynamic and dynamic simulations. But um, there is the, the the variation is not as strong as in the quasi-dynamic uh, case as in the dynamic cases. Um, so I just want to maybe use the last few minutes coming, um, coming to a different topic about slow slip events uh, on non-planar faults. So this is actually uh, uh, some figures from Doe's uh, earlier study showing the uh, variation of source prevent on the northern Cascadia vaccine fault and how that the geometry alone is able to break the source dip into different patches. So here, this central patch uh, has the largest slip, the, the fastest along strike propagation speed, and also the uh, largest slip rate. Um, and corresponds to the segment with the shallowest dipping angle. Um, so kind of similar to what we have observed uh, from the earthquake rupture uh, sequence models. The other thing that um, we can observe from the simulation results is that um, although that the, the subsequents are segmented into different patches and they, they, they show up as individual episodes from the GPS recordings, for example. But um, uh, from the simulation that the SIP seems to be, the SIP zone seems to be uh, interconnected, um, where the interconnection, um, the zones of the interconnection might be sleeping at a slower rate, uh, probably below the current uh, genetic detection threshold. And, and this kind of uh, background underlying slow slip, uh, not visible in the, in the GPS record, uh, might be the reason that's driving some of those inter-ETS tremor activities as, as we, we saw from, um, from Northern Cascadia. And this leads me to my final slide, um, really just kind of pointing out uh, of one of the one of the current activities in my group is trying to integrate the simulation of earthquake sequences and slow sleep sequences into a single framework, and because um, there have been uh, so many fascinating observations uh, from the field, uh, for example the migrating swarms and repeating earthquakes uh, before uh, the 2011 Tohoku earthquake. Um, similarly for the uh, Ikiki uh, earthquake in Chile and this really, really fascinating um, interaction between soft events and large earthquakes in the uh, Mexico subduction zone and many others. Um, Actually, this one is really interesting about uh, this point um, observation of a decade or long of events uh, before the 2011 Tohoku earthquake. So I think uh, all those um, amazing um, field observations is, 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 is um, calling for uh, continued development in the modeling community is how, the, how our models can be applied to try to understand or first try to simulate those complex interactions between the slow and large earthquakes and try to understand their, their, their um, triggering or interaction mechanisms. Um, so here's my uh, brief conclusion that um, I showed that uh, fault geometry can strongly affect the co-seismic and slow slip processes um, on, on large tectonic faults. They affect the rupture segmentation. Uh, with our uh, quasi-dynamic approximation that we found this large scale rupture speed variation correlates with the fault dipping angle variation. Um, this to some extent is consistent with the results from dynamic rupture models uh, from the, the Wenchuan earthquake case. The smaller scale high frequency variations um, tend to uh, correlate more with the false strike angle variations uh, along, along the strike direction. Um, 
the, the second part was really focusing on a, a new or a modified uh, ZG method that can reduce the model results dependence on mesh quality so that uh, we have done a, a series of benchmark uh, examples. I didn't have time to show you here that uh, can incorporate the complex fault geometry, um, the heterogeneities in material properties uh, of fault plasticity, um, additional mechanisms like thermal pressurization, and also the implementation of, uh, of different versions of friction laws. Uh, 